Um, thank you for uh, coming to this final session of the day. I'm Renee Gutman, and I'm with the office of the CISO with a company called Acumont. And I'll explain that in a, a few more minutes in terms of, you know, a bit of my background as well as, you know, a little bit about Acumont. Mark wasn't here to be able to introduce me, and I told him that was fine. He's finishing a speech somewhere else, and I felt that I could carry this. Um, so, again, thank you. Um, who was at Bruce uh, Schnarr's keynote this morning? Most people? So I think you heard him say that information security is hard to sell because people will accept the risk. And if they didn't have a problem last month, what's the likelihood that they're going to have a problem next month? And so my topic today is about aligning secure software development with business interests and why I think that if you can do this successfully, you can actually drive security spend and business engagement. Now, I realize that I'm at the end of the day, and I'm uh, a little bit away from that nice, cool beer. So I think it's probably unlikely that we will be here for the entire hour. But I also wanted to reward those of you that had the perseverance to come to this last session with a giveaway. And it happens to be one of these nice bags that sell for 55 bucks, and I'm sure by now they're all sold out. So there's one here. And I have a book on hackers, Android Hackers Handbook, which of course is priceless. So, and all you need to do is um, stay for at least half of the presentation, okay? And when I get to the point where I have a question for you, and I don't care if you use your devices to find the answer, I just want someone to win this prize because I don't want to take it back home with me, okay? So do we have a deal? All right, good. So uh oh, more technical challenges. All right. Um, so now my mouse isn't going to work here. So all right, um, let me tell you a little bit about who I am. Um, I've been doing state information security for almost 20 years. I was afraid to ask who is younger than 20 years or who wasn't born 20 years ago, but I think I'm on safe ground, sort of, although I think I saw a high school student running around out there. But I've been doing information security for 20 years. I've worked for companies such as Glaxo Welcome, pharmaceutical company. I worked for Capital One. I was actually responsible for putting their very first e-commerce um, customer-facing statements on the internet. Um, that was about 15, 16 years ago. I then uh, took a job in New York. I worked for Time Inc., the magazine publishing company. I started there in 2000, just before 9-11, and I was their very first CISO. I then stayed with the company, and I built the enterprise risk management program for Time Warner, and I was there for about 12 years. My very last CISO role was actually at the Coca-Cola company in Atlanta, Georgia. And I was that company's very first CISO as well. Now, how I got into information security is, is, is sort of interesting. And I won't go into that story, but I'll tell you that I have a degree in archaeology and anthropology. <laughs> you too? I'm in good company then. Or you're in good company, one or the other. Um, so what I can tell you about how it's relevant to being a CISO is that I know from my degree that mankind cannot change their spots. And I have seen it proven over and over again as a CISO. So anything that somebody could possibly dream up in the physical world, whether it was you know, stealing, cheating, you know, whatever it was, they were just going to transport all of that to the internet. And I've been in information security for 20 years, and I've watched it happen, and it hasn't been a surprise at all. But what I absolutely know now, after 20 years, is that information security is not the CISO's problem. It is absolutely a business problem. Um, we can be subject matter experts. We can test software and provide results. We can translate regulations into something the business understands. We can also be first responders when things go bump in the night. But it's absolutely imperative that we have 
the business as a key stakeholder on this journey with us. And the way that I think that we can do that is to leverage application security to get the business attention and to get their commitment to us. I also think that application security drives a long train. It actually pulls a lot of good security practice with it. And I want to talk about that. I also want to talk about, um, so I want to talk about how, how you can do that. Secondly, given the Internet of Things and, and what's happening with um, you know, emerging risks, I want to talk a little bit about how you might go uh, back to your businesses and think about innovating your application security programs to stay ahead of emerging risk. And then lastly, to follow on what Bruce was talking about today, I do think incident management is going to be big you know, going forward. And I want to talk about how you can also leverage incident response to make enhancements to the application security program. So let me talk about why we need to change. So the breaches aren't enough, right, um, to get the business attention. Um, but Time Inc. did an article in July about, uh, and, it was, and it made front page, and it was, about, it was called um, World War Zero. And it was really about how software bugs are becoming the new munitions and how they're being bought and sold. Okay? Bloomberg did an article um, about a week later about information security and why it was so important that, that executives become familiar with it. And then about a week later, um, a report came. Uh, the New York Times did an article that was called Pity the Poor CISO. And it was about how we had the worst jobs in the company and that there was nothing but a bullseye on our back. Um, there was another article that came out um, that mentioned some research uh, about a week later by Threat Track, and it said that executives thought that 74% of CISOs don't deserve a seat at the table. Not only that, 61% of executives thought we weren't qualified to do anything else within a company. 50% of executives thought that we shouldn't be responsible for the cybersecurity spend. And 44% of executives thought the only value that a CISO brought to their organization was so that they would have somebody to blame when there was an incident. If that doesn't say that we don't have business engagement and stakeholders and it's support at the executive level, I don't know what does. So we've got to change the dynamic here. The problem is sometimes we get in our own way, all right? We talk in, as security practitioners with scary words. We use scary stories. We even use scary pictures. We use skulls and crossbones to show people, you know, of APT, you know, how an APT could move through an organization. I can absolutely guarantee you that there's nobody in the marketing department dumb enough to take a picture to an executive with skulls and crossbones. All right? But we keep telling these scary stories, and yet the Verizon data breach report, that, uh, investigations report that came out about a month ago, or I think it was actually early in the spring, said that 92% of all security attacks could basically be translated into nine different patterns. There was also some cyber risk that was written for boards of directors, and it was published by the National Association for Compliance Directors. And it said that 85% of attacks could have been prevented by five simple security techniques. And two of them include patching. Why is it then that we need so many words, and why can't we learn to translate what it is that we do into business English? So I want to talk to you. I said that application security can really get business engagement. So I want to share with you two stories about um, from my experiences, okay? So about 15 years ago, I left the bank and I took a job as a very first CISO for the publishing company. And I joined the team of me, myself, and I, all right? I was, I was it. Um, the, the CI also came to me and said, listen, you're coming up from a financial services firm, so don't be expecting some big financial services budget. So after two weeks, me, myself, and I had made very little progress. We'd had very few meetings with people in the business. And I got worried because I had just moved my family 
from Richmond, Virginia to New York. So I was thinking, heck, maybe I don't need a big team, but maybe they don't even need one security professional. Anyway, as luck would have it, I found out that there was this group of people building the very first e-commerce website for the company. And I paid them a visit. I had to go find them because clearly they didn't know what it was that I did or even who I was. So I went and found them. And I asked them, what are you doing to protect credit cards? And they looked at me like I was a two-headed dog, like protect credit cards. Why would, well, you know, I, I suppose we need to protect credit cards, but this was so far before PCI. I mean, that, it, that this wasn't the reason that they knew they had to protect credit, credit cards. But it was being built by a, a company for a gazillion dollars. And so they were very certain that credit cards would be protected because it was being built by this company being paid a gazillion dollars. So I went to the company and I said, hey, can you tell me how, you, how we're verifying that credit cards are being protected? And they looked at me like I was a two-headed dog again. And I said, hey, you know, I'd like to make sure that these cards are protected. And they said, well, security wasn't part of the statement of work. <laughs> but for $60,000, we will test the software. So the good news is, at the time, you know, they felt very confident that the cards were being protected. The bad news was that they proved that anybody that went to the website that had a little bit of knowledge could manipulate the prices of the products on the website and pay whatever they wanted for the product. So I took this back to the business and I said, hey, is this the way you want this website to behave? And they said, what? You can actually manipulate the pricing of the product? You, as a security person, you actually have the ability to make sure that we're making a profit? Yeah, I can actually make sure that we're making a profit. So you know what? I started to get some traction and get some business because I had related to them with something that meant something to them. Fast forward about three years, and I find out that this group of people want to use a service in the cloud. This was before software as a service, so it was just some service in the cloud, and they wanted to put information out there. It wasn't really sensitive data, but you know, I said to them, how do you know that this company is protecting that information? And they said, well, we're paying them. And I said, OK, um, how about I just verify that the information is being protected? So they gave me some money to test it. And I found out that we could enumerate all of the email addresses for people that had signed up to use this website. Not only ours, but everybody's. So I went back to the business and I said, hey, do you think that this is a good thing? Do you think that this is a feature you know, that you want this software to have, that anybody could come and enumerate you know, all of our company's email addresses? And they thought about it and they said, no, that doesn't sound like a good idea. So I contacted the company sales rep and I said, hey, I can enumerate all of the email addresses for everybody that's a user of this software. And he scratched his head and he handed me over to marketing. And I called the marketing guy. And the marketing guy said, you know, we really didn't design the software to, to reveal all the email addresses of everybody that was using it. However, I think that's a, a neat feature. <laughs> if you run into trouble, you could go look up someone's email address and write to them. And we can have a little community help program going here. So I called a friend of mine in the valley because that's where this company was based. And I said, hey, can you put me in touch with anybody that I can talk to about the state of the security of this particular software product? And he said to me, you want a job? I said, no, I don't want a job. I just want the website to be fixed. Anyway, eventually I got through to them, and they fixed the website. So the good news is, again, as we started to roll out more you know, software as a service, and this is before we called it software as a service, my team got engaged. And the good news is that I was able to leverage the application security program to finally get the business attention and to build that team from actually myself to seven people. And most of them were doing application security with a little bit of incident management and vulnerability management thrown in for good. Um, but you know, I didn't have a, a banking budget at the time, but I was able to get money um, from the business. 
And I also, and I don't know if he's here, I told him I'd give him a shout out. I brought uh, uh, Gary, Dr. Gary McGraw down one time to address all of IT. And he did his great talk that he always does, and I'm sure he'll do tomorrow morning, about why application security is so important. And at the end of the day, we told all of IT that bluntly they worked for me, and they didn't bat an eye. So that's how application security can get you in front of the business and get their buy-in. I don't want you to think I got it all right, however, all right? And um, so a couple things that I absolutely got wrong. I started to take the canned reports and put them in front of the business, and I started using scary words like incomplete parameter validation, cross-site scripting, SQL injection. And I was even dumber to take these scary words and produce a quarterly report where it was Renee's wall of shame where I would you know, list all of the websites that, and their high-risk vulnerabilities and how long it took them to close and um, you know, which groups were doing better than others. So, you know, um, that didn't really make me any friends. I have to be honest about that. And, uh, you know, it was, I was really all stick and no carrot. And that's a real bad mistake. Um, the other thing that I did is I bought a software product to do source code testing. And I didn't have any application developers on my team look at it, and yet I was impacting their, their workflow and their job. Well. No duh, right? The software goes right on the shelf, right? And there's where it lives forever and ever in its shelfware. So again, I don't want to imply that I got everything wrong or right, but I learned some things. And again, this is why we have to get out of our own way, because sometimes it's not everybody else that's to blame, but it's us that's to blame as well. So I think we can turn it around, all right? And I think, again, application security can drive a long train. But it is going to take, um, it's going to take a couple things. It's going to take us getting in front of the business and using words that they can understand. It's going to take involvement. It's going to take transparency around things that are working well as well as things that are not working well. And we have to learn how to be pragmatic and patient and evangelize in business language. So I said I had a giveaway, and I'm almost halfway through. So. This is an example of a sign. I was driving around two years ago on Thanksgiving, and I found a bunch of signs in Pennsylvania that I really didn't understand. And I took pictures of about seven or eight of them, and I took this one. I don't know if you can read it. It says, break retarders prohibited next three quarter or quarter mile. Anybody that can tell me what a break retarder is can have this bag. It is, it's, it slows it down. This is yours. So it's a really good thing to know if you're driving a rig in Pennsylvania. And next time I'm driving a rig, I'll be sure to know what, you know, not to use my Jake brake. But, you know, this is an example of, you know, how we all need to get better and, and, and make sure that we're speaking business language. So I want to talk just very briefly about why this is so important to me. I already talked about it selling information security. Um, but I really believe that application security is so vital to our future. Um, you know, it's been proven now, I think, that people use their mobile phone apps more than they use websites at this point in time. I just read on Tuesday that Google has a, uh, announced a line of um, very inexpensive smartphones for emerging companies, and that's because those governments are starting to deploy services um, to their um, um, constituents for financial services, for medical services, for education. There is no more perimeter in my mind. And application security is the new perimeter. And that's why it is so important that we, we, we really leverage uh, application security at this moment in time to change the way the business thinks about CISOs and the way they think about the state of information security. There's only one way to do this, in my opinion, and that is going to be to get the business involved. Um, I already talked about the mishap that I had with you know, buying software and it became shelfware. You, you're going to have to establish a, a cross-functional team. 
There's a really good book that I've read, and it's called 42 Ways to Creating We. And there's, it's, it's a bunch of little vignettes, about a page, about two and a half pages each. And one of the vignettes is uh, written by a guy by the name of John Manis. And he basically talks about seeking engagement and not compliance. And he talks about why projects fail and about why people start to gripe about them at the water cooler. And that's because they're not involved. Here I had thought that I could change somebody's job and the way they did it without engaging them. And what he says is that in order for you to be able to change process um, and to change, you know, to make a change, you've really got to involve others and co-create methods and outcomes together. So I would argue that there is no one way to do application security, and this is why you need this cross-functional team. The other thing that I forgot to tell you is that I always charged the cost of application security back to the business. There's no way to do that if you don't have their support and buy-in. But if you're a CISO and you're carrying the cost of application security, you can carry the cost of a person. But if you're using the tools and if you're using any kind of third-party services, you have to find a way to build that back. Otherwise, you have what's called an uncontrolled cost. Because you don't have any control over people building applications. And if you're paying all the cost, you, you can't even create a proper budget because you don't know what people are going to really build the next year. So you have to look at different ways to fund the program. But, you know, not only are there different languages, you know, within an organization, but when you go to build out the program, you're going to find that people have an expectation that you test a, a, a brand website that's going to be alive forever and ever and ever differently than you do a campaign that might only be running for two weeks. Right? They don't actually want to spend more to test a website that's only going to be alive for two weeks than it costs to build the thing. So that's why you've really got to you know, get this cross-functional team together and really talk about you know, what are the issues, what are the opportunities, and create sort of a matrixed approach to how you're going to do application security. Then you've got to collectively go and evaluate you know, what are some of the options you know, that are out there and, and creates, you know, a matrix that you can evaluate against. And you might decide, because there are a lot of options, you might decide to leverage some of the new and emerging cloud services. You might also decide that you want to bring in some source code, you know, uh, products and that you're going to run them internally. Um, but those are decisions that I'm going to recommend you make um, collectively. The other thing that I want to warn you about, because it happened to me recently, is that there's a lot of people running around talking about the security of ERM products like SAP. You might need to go back and look at how you're actually um, evaluating software vulnerabilities within a landscape like SAP and, and its extensions. The, the next thing that you've really got to do is document your security program and your service levels. I want to share with you a, an example of something that happened to me. Um, everybody knew that we tested for cross-site scripting, okay? And you couldn't launch a website if you had cross-site scripting errors. So we, my team tested, and we found cross-site scripting errors, and we handed it back to, this, in this case, it was a, a third party. And we said, you have cross-site scripting errors in your code. Well, the first thing they said is, well, every other customer is okay with it. All right. That's, we said, well, we're not, and we'd like you to fix it. So um, they went and they fixed the cross-site scripting errors, and they brought the code back to us, and we retested it, and we found more. <laughs> and I got on the call with these guys, and I said, we told you you had cross-site scripting errors. And they said, we thought that your methodology would test and identify all of the errors and I said, no, we just we test samples, and you know, we, we, once we identify it, we give it to you, and we expect you to do. And, the, and, and it turned into a bloodbath. I mean, it was a holy bloodbath, and everything, you know, we missed our launch date. And so be ruthless about documentation, all right, about your methodology. Make sure that people understand it. And that's why I also think that you've got to co-develop training and awareness, and, and make sure you don't use any kind of scary 
skulls and crossbones when you're doing that. But there's, you know, the good news there, when I was doing application security in the early days, we wrote our own courseware. We, you know, made people attend it for a day. I mean, now you can click on a website, right? And, and you can learn a lot about application security without having to, to go through a day-long course. And this is, again, I have to tell you, this was before OWASP existed. Um, so I'm kind of glad that this is sort of out there now as another resource. The final um, piece of advice is that you've really got to go get executive management support for the program, all right? If you create bright lines in your program that says, we will not launch with SQL ejection, and we will not launch with cross-site scripting, I can guarantee you that somebody's going to show up and ask for an exception. So you need that executive support. I want to tell you another story. I actually got an email from somebody who told me that there was this entire country that because of their economic crisis that they were, that um, the citizens of that country were sad. And they were, they were down in the mouth. And that there was this website that was going to really uplift their spirits. But it had, you know, SQL injection. And I said, no. And the person said, well, you are responsible now for that whole country being morose for a couple more days longer because, you know, you didn't launch this website. And that was the business case that they made to the executives, that I was responsible for the citizens of this country that were going to be depressed for a couple more days. I, I didn't ever think that I would have that kind of power, to be frank, that I could depress an entire country, you know? Who knew? But you know what? They didn't launch. So that's why getting that support, because the, the stories and the excuses can be amazing. But you know, word gets out a couple times that you know, you're not getting an exception and you don't dare ask. You know, it goes a long way to keeping uh, people from asking for exceptions. So I want to talk a little bit about why I think software security really can pull that long train. I've talked about how I think that it can get you in front of the business. I think I've talked about how it can get you engaged with them. You know, um, I, th I think it buys a lot of goodwill unless you kind of screw up the way I did on a couple of occasions. Um, but in the long run, I do think you can buy a lot of goodwill. But where I want to focus right now is this last column, because I think that if you leverage application security properly, you can leverage it to fix your vendor management. Other, other processes, but you can leverage it to fix your vendor management process. When people go to buy software and they do it through procurement, I'm pretty confident that over time you can get procurement to give you a call if somebody's trying to bypass the system. I also think that you can drive other good security practices like getting rid of stale websites and forcing a proper retention policy. I guarantee you the first time that you have a breach of a website, that people forgot was out there, there's going to get, be some religion around pulling down stale websites. I also think that the very first time that you make people aware that you've got a program in place that helped to mitigate a DDoS attack against an application, and you put that in front of the business, you actually create goodwill for your incident response team. And you get some support there as well. I even think, and this might be a stretch, but I don't think so for a lot of big companies, that you can use application security and protecting applications to actually buy threat intelligence. And threat intelligence, in this case, might be nothing more than getting advance notice that somebody might be setting up an attack against your company for whatever reason, whether it's ideological or for some different reason, as Bruce mentioned this morning. But you can get that kind of advance alert. Some of the services aren't cheap, but again, I think that application security and protecting applications from becoming unavailable and hacked, you know, can actually drag that train as well. And finally, the first time that you ever have a breach of your WordPress environment and you have to re-implement a bunch of websites and nobody can find the source code, there's going to be some real discipline around um, backups and testing. And that's why I say that application security can really deliver you know, on the promise of getting stakeholders engaged, buying that goodwill, 
but also pulling you know, more good security practices along with it. So I just want to talk a little bit about how I think, what I've talked about so far is the basics, okay, in terms of setting the, the foundation for a good application security program. I want to just take a few minutes and talk about how I think we need to potentially evolve going forward. So according to Verizon, you know, website attacks were second only to, to point of sale attacks in 2013. The, the, the part that's so hard to believe for me is that 80% um, of website attacks against retailers were leveraging SQL injection. I think we really have to get serious about test testing and mandating testing. Um, you know, also, you know, we, we know there's a trend to hosting applications outside of the company. So if your business comes to you and they say, hey, we're just going to do a lift and shift from, you know, the internal system over to Amazon or, or Azure, and you know that that application is hiding behind a web application firewall, you've actually got to make sure that the, the process, whatever that is, includes going back and potentially remediating that application. Um, the other thing that I can tell you is that when you do outsource software development, you probably need to get the name and number of somebody that's going to respond in the middle of the night when there's a problem with that software. Um, so, the, you know, and again, whether you keep it as the application security people or you make the incident response people keep that number, but I guarantee you something's going to happen and you've got to make sure that you've got a number that you can call after hours. You know, we've seen a lot of third-party connections that have um, impacted companies and led to breaches. We may need to evolve our thinking around application security to start testing the way people come in and um, attach to your air conditioning unit going forward. I think, you know, one of the things that I've learned, too, is that air gap networks really aren't. There's always somebody VPNing in to do some, some kind of work on it. And those air gap networks are running control software, and um, they're running really old software, and sometimes it's still running on XP. So even though you know, I know that air, people that run air gap networks don't necessarily invite others to come in to do testing, this may be the opportunity that we need to go in and actually test them. The other little air gap network that I think we have to start testing is, again, we have to start looking at mobile apps, because you know, there's no air gap between the apps on those phones. Um, finally, you know, I've, we've heard a lot about it's, if, it's not if, it's when you get breached. So this may be the opportunity that you need to go back to your company and identify high value assets and put those on some kind of regular test schedule so that you can make sure that those things are capable of protecting themselves, you know, as your network continues to erode, dissolve, you know, whatever you want to call it. Um, and then lastly, and I'll talk about this one as a particular problem, I, I think we just have a, a true shortage of, of talent. And I've got some ideas about how I think we're going to have to change things around a little bit to, um, to address this particular challenge. Now, I don't think there's anything new that I can tell you about the Internet of Things. I'm sure you're already thinking about how you test embedded devices. Um, you know, software drives everything these days. I was on a plane two weeks ago, and the pilot came on and said the anti-skid light had just gone off, and we couldn't take off until it had, you know, gone away. They tried everything for 15 minutes, and finally he came out and he said, everybody open the shutters so that we can get as much light into the plane as possible, because we have to reboot the plane. So they rebooted the plane, and the anti-skid light went off, and we took off. Thank God for that. So it makes me a little nervous. My car is also portable Wi-Fi. Um, but what, what makes me more nervous is that HP produced a report, and they said that you know, the devices that they tested, they each had 25 vulnerabilities apiece. And 60% of those um, vulnerabilities were cross-site scripting. And there were a lot of vulnerabilities associated with encryption, including the fact that you know, when they were downloading software, they could prove that they could uh, manipulate that process and actually change the software on the way to the device. Um, I read a, an article that said that there was a, a toilet manufacturer and that someone had hacked 
this toilet. It was on the um, it was an, on the internet, and that um, you could activate the bidet or the air dry fan to cause discomfort, <laughs> or you could just flush away all your money. So that was, I guess, a potential type of attack against a toilet. If somebody really didn't like you, they could flush away all your money. Um, you can't make some of this stuff up, right? But what I want you to take from this is that I don't think that people equate everything that has software in it today, like toilets, with application security and, and pen testing and what you need to do to prove that the embedded software is actually working correctly. So I think you're going to have to go out and find the people in R&D in your companies that are doing that kind of work and get engaged with them. And there's two other reasons why I think that's, this is extremely important. One, the kinds of techniques that they need to protect embedded software include things like code signing, key management. So again, there's a lot more that has to be tested when it comes down to the internet of things. And I, and I think that we're going to have to evolve our security program to be more like a product testing program. And I think we're also going to have to look at the end-to-end -end of everything, which may include the way software gets distributed. So I think I, I know that I put my team through some advanced training in this area. And I think that if you haven't looked at what it might take to actually test embedded software, I think that would be a good opportunity going forward. I don't normally talk about compliance. Um, because I don't believe that compliance really buys you security. But if you're in the application security space, I think you have to look at some of the compliance um, regulations or, or uh, standards, especially the new PCI standard, because that has just recently been evolved to take into account the OWASP sta uh, standards as a way of addressing emerging risk. And there's, there's a lot of information in uh, the PCI standard about things that they expect you to test to in really great, gory detail. And not only do they expect you to test, but they expect to see evidence of application security training um, in, you know, inside your company. So I think that this is one way that you can show the business, again, that you're on top of things by making sure that you're keeping up with these um, standards. The other one that I want to mention is California's Privacy on the Go. It's really a standard about mobile security. And more and more, I'm seeing standards come out. Uh, PCI has one, too, about mobile payments around mobile security. So I think, again, to stay on top of it and make sure that your business has faith in you, you, know, you really need to explore the way the compliance, the regulations, and the standards are changing. So finally, because it's not possible to actually predict uh, everything that could ever happen, I believe that application security programs and, and security programs need to change to, to do more threat modeling. So that means really sitting down and thinking about, you know, what are the ways that this application could be abused? Uh, McAfee on their blog, actually, I thought they had a really neat way of talking about threat modeling, and it's not threat modeling. But they asked, you know, they said, um, look, let's look at three questions. So how can somebody ruin us? How can somebody get rich off us? And what regulations do we need to adhere to? That's a conversation you can have with the business. right? You can actually sit down with them and say, what should this application do? And what shouldn't it do? And how could it be abused? And again, I say this because I think that this is going to be key to keeping up that stakeholder support for your program so that um, they're in step with you um, going forward. So my call to action is this. What I'm recommending is that you stay ahead of emerging threats. And I know that this is really a no-dust statement, right? Like, of course, that's what we're going to do. Um, but um, you know, there's a big problem right now, I think, with encryption. Uh, I read some statistic that 58% of iOS apps have a problem with encryption. I can't tell you how many times I've been burned by encryption, by the way. Um, just when you thought that your encryption was working and all those credit cards were fully protected, does an audit show up and run some kind of job and find that the encryption's faulty and there's a bunch of unprotected credit cards? 
you know, I, I really would look for the application security team to make sure going forward that even things like encryption were working properly. I would want my application security team to be able to look at things like tokenization and tell me if that had been you know, implemented properly and if it was working correctly. I would want my application team to be looking at our practices around key management and making sure that that was also working correctly. There's a little gotcha here, by the way, as it relates to emerging trends. I believe that emerging trends are really the next standard of due care. And I believe that if you have a problem, and even if you say, well, that was just a guideline, you know, depending on who you are, that guideline could be used to measure you and your program, especially in the court of public opinion. So I think that it's really important to stay ahead of some of these, um, some of the compliance papers that I talked about earlier, um, you know, some of the guidance that's out there. Um, I also think that um, you've got to re-engage your stakeholders. Go find those R&D people that are writing all that embedded software and have a conversation with them. And if you are putting things out to AWS, go and have a conversation you know, with um, your, your business. Because even if you're running on AWS, somebody's responsible for the top layer, and that is the application itself. right? So you still have to test that. That's not going to be handled by AWS for you. Making sure that your SLAs are aligned with the new agility. You really don't want people bypassing your program. And if you've got a one-size-fits-all program or your, your program really hasn't taken advantage of some of the newer mecha uh, mechanisms for testing software, then go take a look. And maybe now's the time to make some enhancements to the program. I said I would talk about how to address the, the talent shortage. I do believe that we've got to help some of our builders to become breakers. We've got to work with them to develop patterns that they themselves can look at to see if they are coding correctly. We've got to give them some more tools. There was a, um, a company that I've been working with, and they implemented source code scanning and trained their developers. And within the first three months, they were able to save $80,000 in rework. That's a good savings. That's something that you can showcase back to your business. The other thing that I believe we've got to do is we've really got to go find the 20-somethings out there in the colleges and in our communities. Because nothing gets the job done, truthfully, like a 20-something talking to another 20-something in your organization. And um, I think that that's an investment that I'd like to see all of us make into our communities. Finally, I think we've got to really adopt privacy testing into our application designs. There's places where you absolutely have to have a privacy policy you know, in every mobile application that you deliver or you get, you could pay a stiff fine. So that's part of how you might have to update your application security program. And then finally, and I think that this is really important, don't do the dumb thing like I did and just go around you know, telling everybody how they were messing up. You've really got to measure and report on success to make sure that you can continue to show you know, the business value to your key stakeholders. And I think there's some good metrics for doing that. Lastly, I said I'd talk about incident response. Um, for all the good things that we can do, I think every one of us in this room knows that success does not mean perfection. Okay? There's software out there running on XP, which is 15 years old. How could anybody who wrote that software have expected you know, the world that we now live in? Things are going to happen. So we need to be setting expectations and being prepared. Bruce talked about incident response. I think that we, in the application security space, need to have a real heart-to-heart -heart with the people that are doing incident response for um, the companies that we work for. Um, I think that you can um, talk, to them about, um, talk to them about how they're going to identify, how, they're going, how quickly they're going to get you engaged if applications go sideways once they're in production. I guarantee you that they're going to, have, they're going to want to get a hold of you. The other thing that I think we've got to think about is how do you actually find out if you've got a software defect once an application goes into production. Is somebody going to tweet it? I, I'm, I'm pretty sure they're not going to email you, you know, and tell you that you've got a problem with your app. 
At best, they're going to tweet it. So you probably want to get a hold of your social media team and find out who's looking at that and get them to call you if they find there's a problem. And the other thing that I'm not, and I'm not going to advocate for it, but you, know, you may want to look into some of the bug bounty programs that are out there. And even if you don't, just if your company, I mean, Twitter just went in this direction. PayPal is using bug bounties, as is Yahoo. Even if you decide not to go in that direction, all I'm suggesting right now is that you go and create a position uh, statement you know, that when the business comes to you and says, hey, should we be you know, investing in this type of um, mechanism to, to, you know, to identify whether we've been compromised in our applications, at least have an informed position available to get back to them. So you know, Bruce talked about you know, incident management being sort of the new way to get uh, support for information security. I'm just recommending that you leverage that to get support for the application security program going forward. So with that, you know, I'm finished. I did say that I thought I would finish a little bit early. I'm only 10 minutes early, I guess, according to my watch. Um, I, I really wanted to take the time to show you why I believe as a security practitioner and as a CISO, why application security has been so important to me throughout my career and why I think it's going to be so important going forward. I believe that, that this is the only area um, that we can possibly you know, make as much progress in to keep us off the front page you know, going forward. I, I just don't think that perimeter defense is going to get us there. Um, and some of the other things that we, we've been doing in the past, I don't believe that's going to be enough to keep companies off the headlines. I believe that the next way to keep companies off the headlines is to make investments in application security. So thank you for uh, spending uh, 50 minutes with me. And um, I look forward to having a beer with some people tonight and sharing some other stories. I'm sure you all have some good stories, by the way. Um, I love stories. So thank you very much for your time this afternoon.